Welcome to the My Beginner's Guide Rendering DVD. I'm Bob Gundu. Together, we'll explore everything you need to know to begin rendering with Maya software. The content of this DVD will expand on and go beyond the concepts covered in Learning My Beginner's Guide Introduction DVD. This original beginner's guide introduced you to the four main modules in the software, modeling, animation, rendering, and dynamics. This rendering DVD will expand on these concepts and actually show you step-by-step -step how to plan and create high-quality renderings using the different rendering techniques in Maya. A booklet and scene files with all the steps and diagrams accompany this video as well. The lessons on this DVD are designed for you to get more comfortable with using some of the most common rendering tools, as well as understand some basic rendering workflows. We'll begin with a typical workflow for rendering a scene by selecting the view to render and setting attributes in the Render Globals window. Then you'll see how you can use the hypershade to add detail to your objects through texturing. In the third chapter, we'll explore the different lighting options, as well as the different shadow techniques you can create in Maya. By the fourth chapter, you'll learn how to batch render a sequence of images and then how to view them. The latter half of the DVD will cover more advanced techniques and workflows for creating reflections, glows, depth of field, and motion blur. Finally, we'll discuss some other rendering engines available within Maya, including the Vector Renderer. In this first lesson, we'll walk through a typical setup to render a simple table scene. We'll use the Render Globals window where settings like resolution and image quality are adjusted. To define the material qualities of the objects, we'll look at how to create and assign properties using the Hypershade and Attribute Editor. Finally, we'll speed up our various render tests by using tools like Render Region and IPR, which stands for Interactive Photorealistic Render. With this tool, we can make modifications to the lighting and shading and see the changes almost instantaneously. So I'm going to begin by setting our project to Lesson 1. And then opening our file called Table. So in this scene we have a table with a few objects sitting on top. And in this lesson, we're just going to run through a typical workflow for rendering a frame, setting the resolution and quality settings in the render globals, and we'll also change some of the default uh, shaders from this default gray to something else. And we'll look at something called IPR, which is Interactive Photo Realistic Render. And to begin, we're just going to render out a frame um, of this perspective view. And to designate the um, view that will be rendered, you can basically select the um, panel you want to render by just clicking in it, and you'll see a blue highlight around the pane to designate that it's active. And then hit the Render Current Frame button, which is on your status line up here. Um, you can also access the Render View from Window, Rendering Editors, and Render View. I'm going to use the button on the status bar. And what that'll do is render the current frame. And there we have our rendered um, image in the render view window. We can also pick other views to render by selecting the camera from inside the render view. So under render, you can go down to render here and then select the other camera view. So I'm going to select the side here and now it's going to render the side view. Now I'm going to show you how to create a, a new camera because when Maya opens up it has the default four views the top, front, side and perspective. But to create another camera you can go up to create and then go to cameras and then select any of these three different types of cameras. You can use the first one and you'll see at the origin that we have a camera and to look through that camera, because we're looking through the perspective view right now, we want to look through this camera, which is called Camera 1 at the moment. We can select from the Panels menu, Panel, Perspective, and then select Camera 1. And so now we're looking through the new camera that we've just created. And we can then hit the Current Render 
frame button and now it's going to render that new camera. Let's look at how we can now change the resolution of the rendering because right now it's at the default 320 by 240 and improve some of the quality um, attributes because right now it's a little jaggy around the edges and I'm going to show you how to improve that in the render globals window. To access the render globals window you can use the render view window to press this button which looks similar to the render current frame but it has two circles next to it. By opening the render globals from either the render view or from the status line or from the main menu from window rendering editors and render globals this window will pop up with all the options to set resolution and quality you'll also notice that there's two tabs at the top of this um, window and one's called common and we're right now using the default render which is uh, Maya software and so that's the other tab and here you can change the image format and there's several here to choose from. The default is Maya IFF and you can decide here as to which camera you want to render as well and we're going to leave it at the default perspective and here's where you change the resolution. I'm going to increase it to a preset of 640 by 480 but you can actually type in any value you like and I'm going to hit the uh, Maya software tab and here's where we can change the quality of the render. There's some presets here already. Uh, we're currently using preview quality, which is one of the lowest ones. I'm going to go up to production quality. And what that does is goes through and increases some of the um, attributes for us. So if I go ahead and render that now by pressing the redo previous render button, you'll see that it's taking a little longer to render because it's a little higher quality and at first it looks like it's rendering it at the same size as before and that's because our render view window itself is a little smaller and at the bottom here it gives you some information as to what the resolution is that it's rendering and it says 640 by 480 but the zoom is um, something lower than one right now it's at 0.5 which means it's showing me almost half of the resolution that it should be at by hitting the one-to-one -one button it'll show us at 100% the view um, of when it's rendered. So that's a handy button to use when you want to see things at the resolution that it's rendering at. I'm going to close the render view window and the render global settings window and talk a little bit about how to change the material qualities of these objects. Now the table's already got um, texturing on it, so let's look at something like the vase here. And by right mouse button clicking over the vase and selecting the materials menu and go to assign new material, we can select some other different um, materials that we can assign to this object. And right now it's at the default Lambert material. And what I want to do is choose Fong. And that'll open up the attribute editor automatically for us. And you'll see that the new material is assigned to the vase already because it's the Fong is shinier than the Lambert and you can see some specular highlights on the object. And we can control the color by clicking on the color chooser swatch here and picking something, I'll make it a purple. And you'll see that in our perspective view that the colors is updating automatically because this material has already been assigned to this when we right mouse button clicked and assigned a new material. I'm going to accept that new color and we can change things like the cosine uh, power which controls the shape of the highlight. So I'm going to increase the cosine power and change the specular color because right now it's a gray. I want to make it a little lighter colored so I'll make that white. So let's see how that's looking by rendering the current frame. There we have our rendering of the purple vase now with the specular highlight being much tighter and white. So let's look at the cup next to it and do the same thing and right mouse button click on the cup, go to materials and assign a new material and this time I'm going to assign a blend which is something in between a Lambert and a Fong. 
And we're going to make this a transparent glass. I'm going to make the color of this glass black. It may seem strange at first, the fact that I'm coloring it black and making it transparent, but that's basically how you would make glasses too, to move it towards black and then increasing the transparency attribute to almost white. And lowering the, the uh, diffuse attribute makes it look a little more like glass because glass doesn't actually diffuse light that much. So I'm going to render that as well by hitting the render current frame button. So now we have our glass the transparent uh, material that we've assigned to it. And right now it doesn't look much like glass, but we'll see in another lesson uh, how to increase the realistic uh, nature of glass and uh, how to add shadows into the scene because that's certainly what's lacking. Let's now look at the hypershade window. And the hypershade window really lets us uh, get in deeper into making materials and managing um, what objects are assigned to them and allows you to work with textures. So I'm going to relay out the window that we're working with. Just right mouse button click and then select Hypershade Render and Perspective option. So on the top we have our Hypershade, on the bottom left we have our Render View and beside that we have our Perspective View. And we're going to create a new material and assign it to the candle in our perspective view here. And going up to the hypershade window, on the left here we have um, a pull down menu which changes what uh, gets created in this column. And you can see that there's lights, utilities, textures, and materials. I'm going to switch to materials and we're going to select a fong material to be assigned to the candle. So I'm going to press the fong, and what happens is, in our top part of this hypershade, the fong um, material node is created. We can rename that in the um, window right here, or we can do that in the attribute editor, and by double-clicking it, we'll open up the attribute editor. And I'm going to change that fong material to candle shader. And I'm going to change the color from gray to white and increase the cosine power. And I'm going to change the specular color to something a little lighter as well. And to assign it to the candle, we can select the candle in the perspective view. And in the hypershade, right mouse button click on the candle shader and select Assign Material to Selection. So now you can see that our new candle shader is applied to the candle. And this is a great way for you to assign one material node to several objects at once. Another convenient way to assign shaders to your objects in your scene is to use the middle mouse button and click drag and drop right on top of the object. I'm going to close the attribute editor and Let's say we want to assign the orange shader to our orange that's sitting in our fruit bowl. Well, you would just middle mouse button click on the material node in the hypershade and click drag right on top of the orange object. And it's simple as that. So let's see how that looks in our render. I'm just going to press the render current frame. So that took uh, some time to render. So every time we do a test, we don't want to have to render the entire scene if we don't have to. So for example, if I was to assign this apple shader to the apple in the scene by using the middle mouse button technique. So I've assigned the apple um, a new texture. So in the um, render view, we can actually just marquee around the area we want to render. I then just go to Render menu and select Render Region. And now you can see that it's just rendering that one area. It's much faster than having to have to wait for the entire scene to render. Another way to do uh, fast rendering uh, tests is to use the IPR window. 
to use IPR, I simply press the IPR button and it renders the scene like it is uh, with the regular render, but there's no anti-aliasing or reflections or refractions. Um, but it still gives you a really good idea of what the uh, rendering will look like without having to wait for it to render. And once it loads the IPR, we make a marquee around the area that we want to um, test. And so I'll select this bowl area. And let's create a new uh, material for the bowl. So I'll make that a Fong as well. So I'll press Fong under Create Materials menu. And I'll open up the attribute editor for that Fong. And I'll call this Bowl Shader. And let's assign this Bowl Shader to our bowl by middle mouse button and dragging it onto our object in our perspective view. And let's change the color to a beige. Now, now notice in the IPR window, as I'm changing the color, it's updating instantaneously. So this is a really fast way for you to try different colors out without having to re-render. And we'll hit accept. So things like um, cosine power will also update in the IPR window. The specular color, play with the diffuse. So to stop the IPR from updating, you can hit this um, close IPR file and stop tuning button. That's a, looks like a red stop sign. And we can do a final rendering by hitting the render button. So once it finishes rendering, we can save the file by going to File in the Render View pane window and go to Save Image. And here you can save it as whatever file format you like and save it to your hard drive. We'll continue working on the table scene and add detail to the objects through the use of texturing. We'll take a closer look at the hypershade where the visual qualities of the objects like materials, textures, and lights are defined and managed. You'll learn the difference between 2D textures and 3D textures and apply them to a vase and a bowl. You'll texture the vase with a 2D ramp texture and the bowl with a 3D marble texture and the position of the texture will be modified using their placement utility nodes. We'll then use the hypershade to add further detail to the candle by using a bump map and later a displacement map. Going to start off this project by setting our project file to lesson two and then opening our scene called table two. And this is a continuation from our last uh, scene. And what we're going to do is uh, first do a 2D texture and we're going to do it on the vase. And to do that, I'm going to first right mouse button click on the vase and go to materials and go to material attributes and it opens up the current assigned um, attributes for this object and it already has the purple color that we assigned from the last lesson and what we want to do is for color map a texture file or procedural texture um, on the uh, surface and what that does for 2D textures anyway is um, a shrink wrap kind of process where it uses the UV directions on the surface um, to map the uh, texture and to do that we use the map button and right next to the color slider here you'll see this little checkerboard kind of button and by pressing that we'll open up another window and it's called the create render node window and at the top there's different tabs and by default when you click on that one um, it opens up the textures one 
At the top here we have 2D textures and below we have 3D textures. And we're going to work on the 2D textures and make sure your 2D textures um, mode is on normal here. From the various choices here we're going to select a ramp texture. And by pressing that it uh, creates this node called the ramp node and you'll notice in our perspective view that it is now assigned this new ramp texture. So it just totally overrode the previous setting and applied this as the, uh, the new uh, texture. Now in our uh, attribute editor here, as I adjust the ramp, the sliders, you'll notice that it updates in our perspective view. And for those of you who are uh, working along here and are seeing a view um, like this, um, this is shaded mode and to, in order to see the textures you need to have um, 6 pressed which means hardware texture mode. We're going to change the interpolation type of this um, the uh, ramp. Right now it's linear and we're going to change it to none. And what that does is make solid uh, transition from one color to the next. And by repositioning the uh, handles on the side here, you can decide how much each color uh, will be displayed. And you can delete them by pressing the X um, with the box on the right hand side. On the left adjust the position, and on the right you can delete. And what we want to do is get two colors here. And these aren't the two colors we want, so by, by clicking on the handle on the left, brings up the selected color underneath it. By clicking on the chooser, we can pick a different color. And let's make it a purple again. I'll press accept. And to change the bottom one, I click on the handle, and then the color chooser, and we'll make this a, a gray. Now, we want to have multiple stripes on here, so we could add uh, more uh, color into the ramp by clicking in the center part of the ramp, which brings up another handle, and we could change that to a gray and then alternate, but that's a lot of work, so I'm going to click on the X on the other side to, to uh, delete that, but we can change the frequency of um, the ramp by using the utility node called Place 2D Texture. And by clicking on the tab at the top called Place 2D Texture, brings up this information for the placement and positioning of the texture node. And th the main one that you want to change here is the repeat U and V. And we'll change the, and you'll see that there's two columns here, one for U and one for V. And we'll change the V column for repeat U and V to a value of 8. And as I do that, watch in the perspective view, you've repeated it, uh, the texture, 8 times in the V direction. Since 2D textures are mapped to the UV direction on, of the surface, if I was to select and move this object, the texture is locked with the object. Next we'll look at the 3D texture node and apply it to the bowl in our scene. So to show the effects of the 3D texture node, I'm going to open up the render view from Window Rendering Editor's render view and start an IPR render. This will give us feedback as to um, what the texture is looking like as we're working on it. And I'm going to select the bowl uh, right in the IPR window. This is a great feature that you can uh, select objects in the IPR window. I'm going to select a marquee around the IPR range and then select the bowl object in the uh, render view. And the attribute editor will reflect the um, attributes for the, for the bowl. So there's the original um, shader we had applied to the bowl. And we're going to use the map button, just like we did for the 2D texture, and click on that. And from the bottom half of this um, 
textures uh, window, we have the 3D textures. And we're going to select one called Marble. And so immediately, you see how in the IPR window, the uh, marble texture is applied to the, uh, to the bowl. And you also notice that in our perspective view, there's a box at the origin. And this is called the 3D placement node. The main difference between 2D textures and 3D textures is simply that. They're, these are 3D textures, meaning they'll go in X, Y, and Z coordinates. So imagine a big piece of marble that goes infinitely in each direction. And the bowl right now is just showing you that little piece that's intersecting with this uh, virtual piece of marble that goes on forever. So by moving the box, the 3D placement node, you'll notice that in the IPR window that it's changing the look of the marble because we're just basically picking a different piece of the, this virtual marble that goes on forever. And by scaling it, we'll also change the look. So by making it smaller, you'll notice that the, the pieces, the veins of the marble, are changing densities as well. It can be a little awkward by working with the 3D placement node so far away from the actual object. So if you actually select the bowl object, and in the uh, attribute editor, going back to the 3D placement node, and selecting this button here called fit to group, and it looks like a typo, but it's not. It says BBOX, and that basically means bounding box. You'll see that by pressing this button, in our perspective view, the 3D placement node has now um, placed itself um, around the bowl. And so now you can again adjust the actual specifications of where and the size and everything like that. So it's a quick way to get the bounding box off the ground onto the actual uh, object that you're trying to place the 3D texture node on. And we can go back to the marble uh, tab and refine the look of the, the actual marble texture by um, adjusting the sliders. And once you're happy with that, Keep in mind that since this is a 3D texture node, so by moving the object, you notice how the 3D placement node is uh, staying behind. So this will cause um, what they call swimming of textures. So what will happen is that it looks like the marble will be swimming around the surface. So if your object is going to be moving around in the hypershade or um, in the outliner, just parent the 3D texture node underneath the um, transform node of the object and so they'll always move together. So the big difference between the 2D texture and the 3D texture is that with the 2D texture when the object is moving around scaling, deforming, the texture stays with it and that's because it's mapped to the direction of the surface. And with 3D textures they're normally used for things like gravel, bump map, marble, and generally on things that aren't deforming. Um, they can be moving, but deforming surfaces usually require a, some sort of texture, like the 2D texture. And when you get into more advanced techniques, you'll find ways of converting a 3D texture into a 2D texture. So now we're going to dive into uh, to the hypershade again and actually look at all the connections that we're making, um, because that's essentially what's happening with 3D textures and 2D textures that you're making connections between nodes and we can view them in the hypershade. So I'm going to close these windows and open up the rendering editors and then go to hypershade. Here you're going to see the textures like the marble one that we had for the bowl shader and the vase 2D texture node are here. So let's go to the marble um, bowl shader and select it. And by either clicking the input and output connections, meaning that you want to see all the connections that are going into it and out of this shader, or you can right mouse button click on the shader and say graph network. And in the bottom half of the hypershade, it's called the work area. And here you'll see the material that we picked for that bowl, which was the fong. 
Here's the marble texture next to that, the 3D placement node that's controlling the positioning of the um, texture. And then switching the tab at the top here from materials to textures, you can see all the textures that are in their scene. So these are all the wood textures that are being used for the table. And you're going to see the marble and the ramp that we've created. In this top half, I'm going to select the ramp texture and middle mouse button drag it into the work area. And from here, I can use the graph, the input and output uh, connections button. And it'll show me the shading group, the material node that's falling, the texture, and the 2D placement node. So now that these uh, nodes are in the work area, we can play around with them. So if I was to select the Voss Shader Fong node and simply press the delete key, you'll notice that in the perspective window, the Voss has turned green. And when objects like this turn green, it's basically, it doesn't know what material it is anymore. So it doesn't know if it's a Lambert Fong or anything, so it goes green. Um, by pressing undo, the Z key brings back the shader um, material node and you'll notice in the perspective everything's back to normal. And if I scroll over the connections in between these nodes, so by moving the cursor over the connection lines, um, the attributes will pop up and it'll show you the actual connection. So this one says the ramp to dot out color is connected to the vase shader color node. So you can actually highlight these uh, connections and I could press delete to break the connection. So now you'll see that the vase shader is back to its um, default gray, but there's no uh, stripes on it. So this is unlike the previous example where I just deleted it, where it didn't know what material it was. In this case, it does know, but we've broken the connection between the um, texture and the color mapping. So to return everything back to what it was before, I could middle mouse button click on the ramp and drag it on top of the vase shader and a little pop-up will come up and it'll ask me where it wants me to connect that ramp to and I can actually select any other uh, attribute other than color um, but I will go back to color and so everything is now back to what it was before. So basically this work area is where you can break and make connections between different attributes. So we could have this same texture that's used for the um, vase applied to a totally different object by bringing it into the work area, middle mouse button, dragging it on top of another node, and then selecting an attribute that you want to connect it to. To clear the work area, you can use the um, little button up here called clear graph, and that just empties out anything that's in the work area. Next thing we're going to talk about is bump and displacement map. A bump map can fake bumpiness on a surface by creating highlights and shadows. And to do that, we're going to first launch an IPR render. So I'm going to open up the render view window. And we're going to create some texture uh, to the orange object. So I will hit the IPR render in the render view. And we're going to use a texture to define uh, what the bumpiness will look like. And we're going to use a, a fractal texture to do that. So I'll marquee the orange in the IPR window. And I'm going to clear the work area and go to the materials tab and select the orange uh, material node and drag it into the work area. I'm going to go over to the create uh, column here and go to textures and use a 2D fractal texture and with middle mouse button I'm going to click drag that from the uh, create window down on top of the orange material tab and from this list we're going to select bump map. Now as soon as I do that, look in the IPR we're going to see that the orange now has a, a bumpy texture to it. Um, in this uh, hypershade, right mouse button click on top of the 
um, orange shader and select graph network. And in our hypershade work area, you'll see that the, the material node is on the far right. There's this new bump node. There's the fractal that's um, using the, we're using the luminance values from this fractal noise pattern to decide what the bump will look like. And at the very end, we have the uh, 2D placement texture node for the um, fractal. The bump map is an excellent way for you to add uh, some texture to a surface without having to model um, these little bumps on the actual surface. Now this doesn't actually change the geometry at all. So if you look close enough, you'll see that the edge of this um, orange is still very smooth, but to the naked eye, it's hard to tell that it's faking these bumps on here. If the bumps um, need to be any bigger, uh, we will use another technique called displacement mapping, which uh, actually does um, simulate geometry um, off the surface. So in this case, um, if the object is far away enough, or if the bumps are very small, this is an excellent way to add that little bit of texture to a surface. So to adjust the, the amount of bumpiness, we're going to open up the attribute editor um, for the bump node, double clicking on the bump node, and you'll see a bump depth value right now set to 1. I'm going to bring that down to 0.15 and notice in the IPR as soon as I enter the new value. And we'll also select the 2D placement node and adjust the, the repeat U and V to make the uh, bumps a little more dense. We'll increase it to a value of 3 in both U and V. So there we go. Check out the orange in the IPR. And we can do a final render. Next, we're going to use a displacement map to add some, uh, to add an effect like the candle wax is uh, melting. And to do that, we're going to use a 3D displacement map and a different texture, a 3D texture. So we'll select the candle in the perspective view. And up on the, in the hypershade, we have a button called graph uh, materials on selected objects. So by pressing that, we have the candle shader, which is just color at the moment, in the work area. So in the texture column, we're going to go to 3D textures and use a texture called Brownian. So we'll middle mouse button, select that Brownian texture, and drag it onto the uh, candle shader in the work area. And from the list of attributes that pop up, we're going to select displacement map. And to clean up the uh, work area, we're going to go to the candle um, shader in the top part and right mouse button click and select graph network. And so now we have a um, much cleaner representation of the network. I'm going to open up a render view again. And we'll just do a regular render. Rendering takes a little longer in this process because the displacement is um, it's very time consuming at times. So what you'll notice is the candle uh, stick is showing some severe uh, displacement. To soften that, we'll go back into the hypershade and as you scroll over the connections between the, the nodes in the work area, you'll notice that the displacement map is controlled by the out alpha of the Brownian texture. So by going into the Brownian's uh, attribute editor and adjusting some of these values, we should be able to control the way this uh, displacement is going to look on the candlestick. So we're going to open up the color balance section. And there is some attributes called alpha gain. And it's right now is at 1. 
Let's reduce that to 0.2. So now with that new adjustment, we'll render a region in the render view and do a render region now. And you'll notice that the displacement is, a, is much softer, but still we could refine it a little more. So let's go back to the attribute editor for the Brownian texture and change the, the lucinarity from a value of 4 to 3 and change the increments to 0.3 and we'll also select the 3D placement node for that and stretch the Y to 2 and do a render region again so by scaling up the Y in uh, by value of 2 it in effect creates kind of this uh, melting look to the candle. In this lesson, we'll look at the various lighting options and briefly touch upon the resolution gate on the camera. In Maya, you have the ability to simulate natural and artificial lighting effects. As any photographer or cinematographer will tell you, lighting is an essential component to composing an image. Not only are you using lights to illuminate a scene, you're also applying lights to create shadows. For this lesson, we'll experiment with different lights like ambient, directional, point, and spotlights. We'll then experiment with two different types of shadows available in Maya Software Renderer, depth map shadows, and ray trace shadows. Finally, we'll look at how you can turn on the resolution gate of the camera so you can see exactly the framing of the rendered image. So let's set our project to lesson three. And open up the scene file called Lights and Shadows. So in the scene, we have some city buildings and we're going to play with some lights and then uh, talk a little bit about the different kinds of shadows, um, depth map shadows and ray trace shadows. For the first part, we're just going to do a simple render of the perspective view. And what I'm going to talk about here is the fact that there's actually no lights in the scene right now. And what Maya does is throw in a default light just so when you render it's not totally black. Um, if there's any lights in the scene, it'll ignore the default uh, light that it would need to throw in there. So just to keep in mind that when you're doing test renders that the quality of the light's probably not optimal, but it just illuminates the scene just so you can see something. And you can change that option in the render globals. So the first light we're going to add is an ambient light. And we can create lights from the create menu and go to lights and select ambient light. And it puts it at the origin, um, the light mode. And that's pressing 7 on your keyboard. And that tries to simulate what the rendering will sort of look like. It's not totally accurate, but enough for you to see the effect of the light. The ambient lights simulate lighting uh, being emitted evenly across the entire scene, inwards from all directions. And it's often used to achieve a look of indirect lighting. So it's just a general ambient lighting kind of tool. So I'm going to just move the ambient light up in the Y direction to about 16 units. And what we want to do is, is decrease the intensity of that light. And I can just select the light and in the channel box change it from an intensity of 1 to 0.1. Next we're going to add a directional light. And the directional light uh, is used for uh, simulating things like the sun because directional lights are um, usually very distant, uh, very far away. So the lines, for example, the shadows um, are all looking like they're all parallel. And we'll go ahead and create a directional light from create, lights, directional light. And again, it comes at the origin. And by using, now it doesn't really matter where you position this light because it's 
directional from, um, so it doesn't matter if you raise it up or lower. And so I'll just leave it at the origin and go to the rotate tool. Now as I rotate the directional light, you can see the effect in the um, viewport. But what we're going to do is actually make a IPR render so we have a little more accurate uh, rendering of what's happening. So I'll go ahead and press the IPR button. And then I'll select a region here. And I'm going to position the light with a rotation X of minus 20, the Y minus 18, and the Z 4. So we can also change the color of the light, and I'm going to use the attribute editor by hitting Control A. And just like in other attribute um, editors that we've seen, the color can be changed with the color chooser. And I'll make that a slightly yellow color. And you can see in the IPR window the nice yellow glow. I'll press accept. And we're going to move on to another light. And I'm going to just hide this existing light by pressing Control H to hide. And I'm going to refresh the IPR window by pressing this button next to IPR that's called the refresh, the IPR image. So that'll reflect the fact that there's no light in the scene right now, except for the um, very little uh, intensity of the ambient right above. Next, we're going to create a point light. And point lights are lights that uh, actually have a point source, and they radiate outwards in all directions from that point like a uh, light bulb, for example. So I'll go to Create, Lights, Point Light. And I'm going to move this point light uh, behind the buildings, actually. And the values are going to be something like minus 1, Four and that translate Y and 16 and Z. See how now the, the light is emanating from the one point source so you can see it on the facade of all the buildings surrounding it. Let's hide this light and refresh the IPR window and create a spotlight spread so we can use a cone shaped Now to control a spotlight, it's easiest by pressing the T to bring up the Show Manipulator tool. And that will allow us to position the light. I'm going to go behind the buildings again. And use these manipulator handles to point and position the light. I'm going to move it right behind this building. Now another way to position a light is to actually look through the light like it's a camera. So with the light selected, I'm going to go into this other uh, view panel and go to Panels, Look Through Selected. Now this view is the view that I'm looking at um, as if the the light itself is a camera and so you can dolly in and out and as I'm doing this you can see in the perspective view how the the light is moving according to what I'm looking at in this view panel so it's a really quick way to position lights so I'll leave it something like that so we'll open up the attribute editor again and adjust attributes like the cone angle. And as I increase it, you'll see in the IPR window how the spread of that light gets bigger 
and smaller as I move the sliders. You could interactively adjust the, the cone angle from the perspective view as well by using that little switch underneath. And then as I'm adjusting in the perspective view, it's also updating in the IPR. The penumbra attribute, notice how the, the edge of the um, light in the IPR window is quite harsh. By increasing the penumbra angle, you get a much softer edge. Can I decrease the cone angle so you can see that a little more? See how the edge here is much softer than if I have a penumbra of zero. So that's a value of zero. As I increase it, it gives it a much nicer edge. The drop off um, allows you to control how quickly the light diminishes from the center of the spotlight to the edge. So as I increase this, see the intensity of the light in the center diminishes. So this is where a very high drop off. And as I decrease it, the intensity is right up to the edge of that light. In the real world, lights decay over distance. So as objects get further away from the light source, the amount that they uh, illuminate decreases. So we can simulate that by changing the decay rate from no decay to linear. So the scene goes pretty dark because what you need to do is increase the intensity to see that effect. So I'm going to pump in a value of 30. So you can see as objects are further away from the light, they're not as illuminated. So that's another way to add some more realistic lighting effects. So we're going to stop the IPR from updating by pressing the stop IPR um, render button. And we're going to hide the spotlight as well. So the next thing we're going to talk about is shadows. Now, lights can be set to cast shadows onto objects. So Maya supports two types of shadows, depth map shadows and ray trace shadows. Depth map shadows are recommended for the most cases because they're just faster to render. However, you're not going to get some cool effects you can get with ray tracing, like reflections, refractions, and the shadows that you get with ray tracing um, allows you to um, create uh, semi-transparent shadows. So if there's a piece of glass that was dirty or semi-opaque, the shadow for that would be um, the same where there's a little bit of light coming through. You can't get that with depth map shadows. So there's an advantage with depth map, the fact that you can get something rendered much faster, but ray trace allows you to have more control. But we're going to start, start off with depth map shadows. And I'm going to open up the outliner so we can pick the directional light because it's hidden right now and we'll go up to display show selection. So now the directional light is back into our scene and to turn on depth map shadows it's uh, the shadows are controlled by the light source so the attribute editor for the light um, will have the settings to turn on shadows. There's a tab here in the attribute editor called shadows. You can change the color of shadows. We'll leave it at black. There's a button here called use depth map shadows. So we'll turn that switch on and we're just going to render the perspective scene with the directional light. So you can see here that the shadows are very parallel with each other, giving the um, illusion that the light source is very far away when you want to create shadows coming from the sun. So we'll hide the directional light by pressing Control H, which will hide the selected object. And we're going to select the point light from the outliner and then go to display, show selection. And in the attribute editor, we're going to scroll down to the shadow section, open up that tab and turn on Use Depth Map Shadows. And we'll go ahead and render that in the render view. So you can see how the 
the shadows are radiating uh, from that point light, unlike the, the directional one. This point light is very similar to the spotlight. Um, with the spotlight, we, we can control how much the spread that, that light will have, because right now that point light is illuminating everything in its uh, vicinity. So we'll hide the point light and now talk about how to refine the actual characteristics of the shadow. And we're going to use the spotlight. So I'll select that in the outliner, go to display, show selection, and also turn on depth map shadows. With those settings, I'm going to go ahead and press render. Now, depending on your settings, you may be okay with the quality of those shadows, but in some cases, the um, edge of the shadows become very jaggy. And I'm just going to do a render region around that area. And to increase the uh, resolution of the edge of those shadows, we can go to depth map shadow attributes section and increase the deep map resolution from 512 to something higher like 1024 and render that region and immediately they become a lot sharper. Now maybe you want to make them softer. To increase the softness of the edge of those shadows, we can go to the deep map uh, filter size and increase the value to something like 10. Now if I render that region again, now they're a little um, softer but the rendering time was increased as well. And because of the fact that we're, we're um, filtering the uh, depth map, the resolution of the um, deep map doesn't have to be as high. So we can go back and actually lower the deep map resolution to 256. Um, we're gonna get a softer shadow. So we are re reducing the resolution, but we're increasing the filtering. So uh, we're blurring it so you don't actually see the the jagginess of it. So I'm going to redo that entire render. So now we get a much softer um, shadow and it rendered quite fast. So these examples were all using the uh, depth map shadows and they're the most economical ways to create shadows but they do lack the ability to do some um, effects like showing some sort of transparency through the shadows. So if there was a um, opaque material and you wanted the light to pass through, but the shadow to have like a half uh, gradation in it, you wouldn't be able to do that with a depth map shadow, but you can with ray trace. And we're going to go into ray trace shadows a little more in lesson five. The next thing we're going to talk about in this lesson is cameras. And for cameras, we're going to open up another scene file. So I'm going to go to file open and it's called cameras. So this scene is just a um, some mountains on the desert and on the left we have the render view and I just wanted to show this quick lesson to show you how to uh, turn on your resolution gate to help you position the camera um, and also get uh, more accurate results when you render so it'll show you exactly the framing of what you're rendering. And to do that, you basically just, in the view panel that you want to render, you go up to view and go to camera settings and turn on something called resolution gate. And that just puts a box to show you exactly the framing of what you're about to render. And the other handy thing to turn on is the, is the safe action. So action safe is basically a guide for you to um, use uh, to contain your objects and action happening within these lines.
And the other one to turn on is if you have titles in your scene, um, and that's save title. And just like the action, it just gives you a guide of where you should keep your titles inside. And you know, if you position your camera and then hit render on this side, it'll give you the exact same um, angle inside these boxes that gets rendered. And something else you can play with while um, we're in the camera section here is to select the actual camera that we're looking through. We can go to view and select the option called select camera. And if I open up the attribute editor, we can play with some things like angle of view, which uh, simulates a wide angle look. And there's many things you can play with here. So I encourage you to go through the settings for the camera. So far, we've been just rendering single frames. In this lesson, we'll look at how you can set up the render globals to render out animations. Once the entire animation is rendered, you'll learn how to view the animation using the fcheck utility. So let's start by setting our project to lesson four. And opening our scene called render animation. And up until now, we've been uh, rendering one frame and to render a sequence of images in Maya it's called batch rendering and batch render is actually a separate process that's launched to render the uh, sequence of images so it is kind of a memory uh, intensive so if you have other applications open including Maya it may actually slow down the performance but uh, for this little scene should not be a problem. So the actual scene is of some chess pieces falling and the animation itself is 100 frames long and to set up the settings for the batch render we have to open up the render globals and within here we can set things like the file name prefix and in this case I'm going to type in chess pieces falling. Now if we left it blank, it would just simply take our scene file name and then add the extensions on it. This way it's nice for you to get to customize the, uh, the name. And as we scroll down, you can see here that it says frame slash animation extension, and it's set to single frame. And we want to change that, and you can select any one of these and I'm going to select the one right underneath it and it gives you an idea up here of what it's going to look like with the naming convention and the extension that you've chosen. And underneath that is the image format. I'm going to leave it as my IFF. And like I said, our animation was 100 frames long and the default setting here is 10. So we want to change the end frame to 100. And by default, the camera's um, rendering view will always be perspective, but you can change that to front, side, or top. And you can set your resolution. We'll leave it at 320 by 240. And that's pretty much all you need to set to start an animation rendering. So I'll close the Render Globals window and go to the Render menu and select Batch Render. So what that's doing now is starting the separate process of it rendering and to view the progress of the render we can open up the script editor and that's right down here at the bottom right hand corner and by clicking on that you see a progress of the percentage of the frame that's rendered and it tells you actually where it's rendering it to and since we have lesson 4 set as our project it's going into the images directory within lesson 4 and it's rendered up to eight frames so far. And it'll go through this process until all 100 frames are rendered. To cancel your batch render um, before it's finished, you can go up to the same menu and there's an option here called cancel batch render. 
but we're going to continue it to render. So I could continue to work on the scene. You don't have to have the, the script writer open or anything else. And you'll notice it's a little bit of lag in my tumbling, and that's because the CPU is using some memory to uh, render out some of those frames. But we could still play the animation and continue our work while it's rendering. I'm going to open up the script editor, see where it's at. When all the rendering is uh, completed, it'll give you a message saying result rendering completed. And now to view your animation, we use a utility that's included with Maya called fcheck. And in your applications folder within alias's uh, folder, you'll find a little app called fcheck. And just to launch it, you'll find that there's a very simple UI to control the playback of your animation. So we'll go up to File, Open Sequence, and within the Lesson 4 folder, there's another folder called Images, and inside there, we'll click on the first frame of the animation called Chess Pieces Falling dot one dot iff, and click OK. And now what it's doing is it's importing all of the animation into RAM, and you can pause by hitting the space bar. You can click drag right inside the window to play backwards and forwards. And you can control the speed. You can go by one frame if you like. It's a very simple application. And that's it. You can watch your animation. And the people on a, on a Mac can actually save out this uh, animation as a, as a quick time movie. In this lesson, we'll learn how to create specific effects using the Ray Tracer and other effects like Glow, Depth of Field, and Motion Blur. Turning on Ray Tracing in the Render Globals adds the ability to render reflections and refractions, as well as add shadows. You'll learn how to use this feature to render two of the same objects, one is glass and the other is metal. In another scene, you'll learn how to add a glow effect to a light as well as to a shader. The third effect that we'll cover is Depth of Field. You'll learn how to render a scene where you can have a specific distance from the camera in focus while everything else is out of focus. Finally, you'll see how you can add realistic effects to an animation by adding motion blur. Let's start our lesson by setting our project to lesson five and opening our scene called ray tracing. And in this lesson, we're going to explore the different uh, special rendering effects that you can create with Maya. Uh, things like ray tracing with reflections, refractions, and accurate shadows, glow, depth of field, and motion blur. And the first thing we're going to look at is the ray tracing. And with ray tracing, you get some really neat effects. And there's two objects on our table in the scene. And one is um, transparent, and one is this black... Uh, opaque material and they're both sitting on this table so I'm just going to do a quick render by clicking the render current frame and the result is pretty flat and the glass flask on the left it's not looking much like glass and the metal flask on the right isn't looking much like metal and there's no shadows either so the first thing we're going to do is turn on ray tracing. And to do that, we have to open up the render globals. We'll go to the Maya software tab and scroll down to the ray tracing quality and turn on the switch that says ray tracing. Now, just with that option turned on, let's do another render. You'll notice that the ray tracing option uh, makes it render a little slower, but you can see the results immediately. There's reflections happening, 
and uh, the glass is looking a little more like glass but there's a lot more we can still tweak to this we'll select the black flask and look at its surface qualities in the attribute editor so let's increase the, the reflectivity of this object and change it from 0.5 to 0.9 so we'll increase that value and let's do a render region for the flask so that's looking quite good let's also decrease the reflectivity of the glass so I'll select that object bring down the reflectivity from 0.5 to point and now we'll render a region around the glass flask another thing we can do to make this look more like glass is enable refractions because up until now the glass hasn't looked convincingly because real glass refracts light as it passes through in the ray trace section in the attribute editor there's a button here for refractions so we'll turn that on and we'll change the refractive index to 1.3 let's render that again and that that alone is what makes glass look like glass so you can see the distortion of the table through the um, glass now. Let's add some shadows to the scene just so we can compare uh, what ray trace shadows look like compared to depth map shadows. Let's just do a depth map shadow render first. So in order to turn on depth map shadows we need to select the light. So I'll select it from the outliner, go to point light, and in the attribute editor, click the shadows tab and turn on use depth map shadows. And I'll re render the scene. So it's using ray tracing to render the scene, but the shadows are using depth map shadows. Notice that both objects cast solid shadows, which is desirable since the glass flask should be casting a transparent shadow. So now we'll try ray trace shadows. In the attribute editor, I'm going to scroll down past depth map shadows, and there's an option underneath it called use ray trace shadows. By turning that on, it toggles the depth map shadows off. Now we'll re render the scene with ray trace shadows. So now you can see the glass object with transparent shadows, which is looking far more realistic than solid ones. We can also soften the shadows because notice how the shadow isn't getting any um, fainter as it gets away from the object. So we can change that. In the ray trace shadows attribute section of the point light, we can increase the light radius to two and the shadow raised to 20 and re-render that the rendering times will be much slower with these options on that's why depth map shadows is more popular, but with ray trace uh, reflections, refractions, and shadows, the quality is much nicer. So there's the final render. And you can see that the shadow, uh, as it gets further away from the object, is becoming more feathered.
at the top. The next effect we're going to look at is a glow. We'll open up a scene called glow. So Maya supports two types of glow, light glow and shader glow. And if I just do a render, the sphere is illuminating on the side with the point light, but you actually don't see the point light source. So we can add a glow to the actual light. So we'll load the lights attributes in the attribute editor, and we'll scroll down to light effects section and open that up. There's an attribute here called light glow. And by pressing the map button next to it, it adds an OptiFX node. So let's start an IPR render. And I'll select most of the area here. And right away you'll see that the point light is now glowing with a four point star halo. So we can play with the number of star points and we can add a halo. Whoa. Some neat effects here. We can also add a shader glow. So we'll select the sphere and we'll go to the Lambert material for that sphere and do the same thing. Go down to special effects and increase the glow intensity to 0.8. And you'll see in the IPR window that the, the sphere is also glowing now. The next effect we're going to look at is depth of field. And we're going to open up another scene called depth of field. With depth of field, we have the ability to uh, make certain uh, areas in the scene in focus and other parts out of focus. So let's start by just rendering this scene as it is now. And you can see that every object is in focus here. In order for us to use depth of field, it's important for us to know how far certain objects are from the camera. And for that, we're going to turn on heads up display. And turn on object details. So as I select different objects in the scene, it uh, relays a value indicating how far it is from the camera. So the object that you want to keep in focus, and we'll pick this one, and the distance is around 14 from the camera. So let's bring up the attribute editor for the camera, for the perspective camera. So we'll select the camera by going to View, Select Camera. And in the attribute editor, Go to the depth of field tab and turn on depth of field. And the object that we've selected, um, its distance was around 14. So we'll enter that into the focus distance. And now let's render the scene. See how everything in front and behind that object is out of focus. The last effect that we're going to look at is motion blur. And so we'll open up the file called 3D motion blur. So this scene has a helicopter with uh, propellers. And there's actually animation on the scene. So I'm going to press play. You can see the blades rotating. And we're going to add some more realism by adding some motion blur. And when objects move very quickly, in front of a camera they become very blurry. So we can simulate that effect by using motion blur. And there's two kinds of motion blur in Maya. 2D motion blur, 3D motion blur. 2D motion blur um, kind of adds a uh, fake motion blur to the um, moving objects. But a more accurate way to, to create motion blur is to use a 3D motion blur. So I'm going to go to eight, frame 18 and just render the existing um, 
scene. So we have just a regular um, render here with no motion blur. So we'll open up the render globals and click on the Maya software tab and scroll down to motion blur and turn on motion blur and press render. And the quality is quite low right now. So let's scroll back up, change the quality from preview to production quality and press render. And so we get, we're getting some motion blur, but we can exaggerate and increase that uh, motion blur by going to the blur by frame attribute and increasing that from one to a value of three. And that just takes um, three frames into account to calculate the motion blur. So let's try that. We get a fast moving propeller now with the motion blur. So you have some interesting ways of adding some um, realistic effects to your renders by using depth of field, um, using ray tracing for um, reflections, refractions, um, using ray tracing for um, more realistic shadows, and we have uh, motion blur. We've looked at Maya's default software render until now, but there's actually three others that are available to you. The others are Maya Hardware, Mental Ray, and Maya Vector. The hardware render relies on your computer's video graphics card to produce images. This is generally the fastest rendering process, however, it can produce some of the software effects like shadows or reflections. Most particles can only be rendered with this hardware renderer. Mental Ray is the third party renderer that is integrated into Maya. Much like the software render, it can achieve very high quality results, but also offers some unique features like global illumination. Finally, the vector render can also create some interesting effects, as well as export Adobe Illustrator and Macromedia Flash formats. This render can also be used to create cartoon-like effects, but can also output to any of Maya's other regular image formats. This lesson will focus on the Maya vector render. Two of the four renders, uh, Maya Vector Render and the Maya Mental Ray Render, are implemented as plugins. And we can view the plugins in the Plugins Manager from Window, Setting Preferences, and Plugin Manager. Here you can see the list of plugins that are available to Maya. And we have Maya to Mental Ray plugin, and it's the acronym here is Maya, T-O-M-R, Maya to Mental Ray and it's loaded, and the auto load button basically loads the plugin once Maya launches. You can also see the Maya vector render in the list, and it's loaded. To choose which render you want to use, you have four options. Within the render globals window, there's a rendering using pull down at the top, and here you can see the four different renders. The default is Maya software. You can also access the different renders from the render view. Here there's also a pull down with the four renders. Also within the render view, there's an options menu and within there, you can select which render you want to use. Finally, from the main menu, under the render menu tab, there's also a render using, there's also a render using option and the four renders are available here as well. In the Render Globals window, the second tab will always be the attributes for the selected render. Right now, the selected render is Maya Software, but if I change that to Mental Ray, the second tab here will change to Mental Ray, and in that tab, all the attributes for that render are available. When launching Maya, if you always use a particular renderer, you can set that as your default. So if we go under Windows, Setting Preferences, and Preferences, by selecting Rendering from the left column, you have the option to then set which of the four renders you want to always launch Maya with. For this lesson, we're going to experiment with the Maya Vector Renderer.
So I'll set our project to lesson six. And open up the scene called Vector Renderer. The scene opens up with a model of a head on a pedestal. And there's actually animation on it. It just spins the head around. So let's just begin by rendering our scene with the default Maya software render. Now let's switch over to the Maya vector render. I'll use the pull down in the render view. And I'll open up render globals. And you'll see that the Maya vector tab is now located beside the common tab. So let's render a single frame using the default settings for the Maya vector. The rendering will look quite flat because we haven't uh, set any of the options, but already it's looking uh, like a cartoon kind of rendering. Let's refine the look of the vector rendering from the render globals. First thing we want to do is turn on the edges, and that's under the edge options. So I'll re-render that scene with that option on. So now we have an outline defining the shape of the objects. Let's render out to a Adobe Illustrator file. We go back to the Common tab and switch the image format to Adobe Illustrator. Let's also add a prefix to the name. We'll call this Maya Vector for Illustrator. So that way it'll be easier to find in the, on your hard drive once it's rendered. Now let's change the fill options under the Maya Vector tab. And we'll turn off the fill objects. Because you may only want the outlines to be imported into the Illustrator file. So let's do a render of that in the render view. And now we only have outlines uh, on a white background. To export this into your Illustrator file, because what we're looking at in the render view is a rasterized preview of the image. So this isn't the actual Illustrator file. In order to export it into Illustrator, you need to batch render it. And under the render menu, we go to batch render. So now it's exporting a vector file into uh, Illustrator format. Now in our hard drive, in the images directory for lesson six, right here is our Maya for illustrator.ai file, which we can now import into Illustrator. Let's go back to Maya. Let's switch it to the Macromedia Flash format. Let's turn the fill objects back on. And let's switch the edge color to white. And we'll also turn on the reflections. I'll re-render that frame. So now we're getting reflections as well behind the, um, the head. So as I mentioned before, this scene actually has animation from frame 1 to 29. So let's render out a flash animation uh, with those frames. Let's go back to our common tab, switch the frame animation extension to multi-frame, and we'll change the prefix name to Maya Vector for flash, and we'll change the end frame to frame 29. And back in the Maya Vector tab, I'm going to turn on an option at the top here called Open in Browser. So once the animation is finished rendering, it'll automatically open up the Flash uh, animation in the web browser. So we're going to use a batch render now because the render view will only render out single frames. So we'll go ahead and do a batch render. And like the other time we did the batch render, we can monitor the progress with the script editor. 
Now, as soon as the animation is done, your web browser will open up playing the flash animation. So there's our animation now, the 29 frames exported into flash. We've now covered the essentials for rendering in Maya. You've learned how to use the render globals to set your resolution, your preview quality, and set which one of the four renders you want to use. Secondly, you learned how to use the hypershade to connect 2D and 3D textures to the material node. You also used a bump and displacement map to quickly add more detail without having to modify the geometry. Lighting and shading was the focus for the third chapter. Here you applied various lights to a cityscape to learn the difference between ray trace shadows and depth map shadows. Lesson 4 taught you how to render a sequence of images by making the changes in the render globals. You'll also learn how to view the animations using FCheck. There were some advanced techniques for rendering with the ray trace option for more realistic renders in Lesson 5. Other rendering effects like glow, depth of field, and motion blur were also explored. Finally, you learn how to have some fun with the Maya Vector Renderer. To continue your learning path, I recommend you explore the online tutorials available with Personal Learning Edition or Maya Complete. Also check out the Alias Store where you can find more DVDs and books like the full version of Art of Maya and Learning Maya Foundation. The next of the Beginner's Guide series DVDs is Dynamics. Until next time, I'm Bob Gundu.